of light. Um, and then, you know, brothel after brothel. And I just love that part of medical missions is what we were able to do um, was actually provide a, a link between the, the ladies who work in the brothels and then the ministry center. Um, a lot of the ladies who work there, it's very hard for them and, and somewhat embarrassing, I think, at times um, to come through and actually walk through the doors of the ministry center. And they said that, that it takes probably 10 or 15 times of inviting somebody to come to the ministry center before they would actually step through the doors. And it was such a, a neat way that we hosted a medical clinic. But then through that, what we were able to do is link a lot of these ladies to either social workers or skills people who already work for the ministry center themselves. Um, there was this one story of uh, that I just find so, so amazing and such a God thing is uh, mom had brought in her two daughters with her. And the mom had gone upstairs to uh, meet with our nurse midwife who was up there. And um, one of our other providers met with his daughters and they were just complaining of a lot of pelvic and, and lower abdominal pain. And I got to the heart of the issue that these girls were being sexually abused by their father while well, their their mom would go and and in the brothels and through that we were actually able to get a social worker involved with these girls we were able to get law enforcement involved um, and kind of intervene in the situation but I just think that is so neat how God used a medical clinic and a dentist and um, that avenue of medicine as link and, and kind of um, to just bring these ladies in um, is just a really, really neat thing. And I think that is key. And that's the reason why we do short-term mission trips, right? It's to come alongside missionaries who are laboring in the fields, who are, um, you know, kind of day after day working and, and ministering to these people. We come alongside them, we support them um, and, and kind of maybe do something that they're not able to do on a typical basis. Um, and, and kind of serve alongside them. I think that's the reason why we do short-term missions and, and why it's so powerful. Um, pictured here um, on the left, um, we put these two pictures together, but on the left is being built one of the largest brothels in the area is actually gonna hold over a thousand beds. Um, and that was the back window. Um, we look out the window of the clinic and that was what we saw. And that is, um, uh, Ariana, she was one of our medical doctors on the trip ministering to one of the ladies. And that's what the Lord spoke to me over and over and over again is in the midst of such darkness is when light is so much more uh, profound and so much brighter. And, um, you know, there we would literally, but where I was seeing my patients, I would look out and see this massive brothel that was being built. Um, and then at the same time, I had this one lady she was so wonderful and um, she was kind of sharing some medical needs with her and then after I asked her if there was anything I could pray for her about or um, and then she asked me um, you know who Jesus was <laughs> and when somebody asks you that I mean that's pretty awesome um, so I was able to tell her who Jesus was and one of the questions she asked me was um, do people get punished for doing evil things and, and why would a God love someone who, who does things that are wrong and was able just to kind of share the story of the gospel and how Jesus kind of loves us where we're at and regardless. And she wound up giving her life to Jesus um, that afternoon. But again, I, it's just that that contrast of, of the darkness and the light, but God is even more bright, even more powerful in the darkness, um, even when it's right in front of us. One of the neatest things <laughs> that I think I'll remember about this trip, um, you know, five, 10, 20 years from now, is on the very last night that we were there, we did uh, a prayer walk as a team throughout the entire red light district. I think it was a, a Saturday night that we had left. And you know, on the weekends, that's kind of when unfortunately everything in that area and in that neighborhood seems to come to life. And it was later at night, just after dinner time and everything was kind of in full blown, full operation mode, so to speak. And in close to the one mile radius, if I'm remembering right, of where the ministry center is in the midst of the red light district, there's uh, over 15 brothels in that area. So it's a pretty happening spot, unfortunately, and just seeing um, kind of everything live. And you know, we were there during the week, doing the clinic kind of during the daytime hours where, yeah, there was some activity, but nothing like you really see at nighttime, especially, and especially on a weekend when folks are you know, off of work and everything. Um, I remember we, we came back together as a team after going out into the, the sidewalks and walking around and a couple of different folks from their, their missions team led us around and showed us some of the different things and 
phone some certain aspects of it out to us. And just when we came back together as a team being just kind of like, God, wh wh where are you in the midst of all of this? You know, seeing the, the shame that all of the men walking in that neighborhood seemed to have their chins were in their chest. They couldn't make eye contact with you as you walked by, yet there they were, you know, and it wasn't a secret really what, what each of them were there, there to do. I remember this verse that the Lord uh, gave me when we were just doing that prayer walk, and it's this, it's Psalm 61, verse three, and it says, for you have been my refuge, a strong tower against the foe. And that verse came to mind just because the building, the ministry center where we were, um, is, if it's not the tallest building, it's one of the tallest buildings in that neighborhood. And just praying, Lord, would this building be a refuge for these ladies uh, as they are, you know, hopefully rescued from this, this terrible industry and terrible uh, way that they feel that they need to support themselves and support their family the way that they found themselves to be employed, so to speak, uh, through prostitution uh, in the midst of all that's going on there. So that's kind of a, a shot from the red light district there and all that we got to see during the clinic. So. Um, yeah, just some aspects of kind of the medical clinic. Um, and then we'll kind of ask Hannah skip through this and jump to this section. But this was some of us with our um, translators. And again, we just, um, you know, really impacted, um, and especially in medicine, as a lot of, you know, doing medical missions overseas, I think a huge component of that should be supporting and training um, you know, the medical community that's already established and that's going to be there when you're, when you left and when you leave. Um, and so, you know, we had different medical providers serving alongside with us, um, and that's a huge kind of focus in, in other GHO teams. And, um, so just that partnership again, strengthening that was really important for us. But um, the last slide, if it's there, that that was just me eating cow heart. I found cow heart on the street, and this was just a word to the wise not to do that um, <laughs> if you ever get presented with that opportunity. But anyway, I don't even know how that exactly ended up in there. But <laughs> the last slide that we just wanted to end with um, is actually um, Patrick and I downtown. Um, in downtown Rochester, New York. And you're probably gonna ask yourselves, um, this does not look very Bolivian and you are correct in saying that. Um, but one of the things in, that um, the Lord had kind of laid over our hearts is, you know, this trip was in 2020. Um, so almost two years ago at this point and then COVID kind of hit that, you know, limited our, our ability to go overseas. One of the things that the Lord spoke to our hearts is um, to have a mindset of mission have a heart that is missions, whether you're in Bolivia or whether you're here in Rochester, um, that God has called each of us to be the light right where we're at. Um, you know, we've, we kind of pray, you know, the full armor of God over each of us before we go into the emergency department at RGH. And, and, on the, and when I, you know, kind of man the COVID floors, that God would use us um, with our coworkers, that God would use us with our patients. Um, this is something, a ministry that we've partnered with downtown, um, which is called the Hope Shop. It's part of the Gearheart Neighborhood Outreach Center that Dr. Morehouse um, and Susan have, have uh, spirited uh, for many years, the, the partnering medical clinic. But um, we've joined with them in the last year. And, and the Lord has kind of, uh, as we've done international missions, he's, he's challenged us to be missional here in Rochester. Um, and and um, when we're not overseas, that, that should just be, you know, something that just stimulates us to kind of look towards home and say, God, how can you use us here? How can you use us in Bolivia? Um, and just kind of be be open to that wherever. So um, we are excited. Like Patrick said, we are going to Nicaragua in April. We're helping to co-lead a team there. Um, that'll be a medical dental team. So be praying for us as as you're as we're doing that. Be praying for us as we love on the people of Rochester too. And, um, and our hope you know, for you is the same, that God would burden your heart for the mission field, um, whether that be in Bolivia or Nicaragua or at Strong or at your, your family practice office or wherever God has you called for right now. Yeah. <laughs> That's what we got. That, uh, we've heard two very, uh, wonderful presentations here. Perhaps we can take a break to uh, uh, for question and answer uh, for um, Ethan and Elizabeth uh, and for Patrick and Janelle uh, about the uh, what they've shared. Anyone have a, 
a uh, question they'd like to pose to uh, one of these, Jerry? Um, my question is in um, the, the brothel situation in Bolivia, you said the one building had 1,000 beds. Can you explain that further? Yeah, so it was a, just in, in terms of, you know, legalized prostitution for us being there, that was a, a huge shock, obviously, to just see the, the widespread industry, I guess you can say that um, how it how it is there and it's fueled by the government in a way where it's, a, it's not promoted, certainly, but it's allowed and it's, you know, given a, an avenue to exist, so to speak. Um, in this particular one that you're mentioning that we mentioned the, the newest one that they were building a thousand beds, basically one bed equals one woman, one woman working uh, in that bed. So you can just imagine the, the magnitude uh, and the amount of volume that they're able to accommodate, not just for ladies who are working there, but uh, for people who are coming in, uh, paying to, to seek sexual services from these places. So, and this is, that was certainly the biggest one by a, a fairly large margin in terms of its size, but, um, you know, do the math, quick math of what 15 of them even at 10 to 20% of that size can, you know, look like in terms of a, a factory for just debauchery. So that's what it is. And I'm seeing in the comment, um, Mike in said in conjunction kind of with your question, what drives the demand for the brothels? Um, I think the easiest answer is a sin, right? And human nature um, on a deeper level. And I got kind of a, my eyes open to this, my, my translator that I worked with all week um, his name was Gabriel. He was wonderful, um, just on fire for the Lord, just really loved the Lord, had a passion for people, um, but talked about kind of the culture, the sexual culture of Bolivia. Um, and I think the same is here in the United States. It just looks different. So for example, you know, he had mentioned um, when he, for his 12th birthday, his dad and his uncles um, had taken him to the red light district and said, for you, in order for you to be a man, um, you know, you have to go into one of these brothels and, um, you know, prove yourself to be a man. And that is the culture that they've developed of what manhood is. Manhood starts kind of with this suffering mentality of uh, a woman. And many of the ladies that uh, were in the brothels that I, I got a chance to talk to, um, that many of them were married or with other, or with other guys on a long-term basis. Um, and some of their husbands knew that they worked the brothels and some of them didn't. Um, but it was, it was just very interesting. At the end of the day, even though it was accepted culturally, there's still that shame in every single person's face. I mean, when we walked to the brothels, the, the, the guys wouldn't look me in the eye. They, they just, they really would look down. Um, the ladies were embarrassed to kind of um, come right out and say it. So even though it's accepted, it, it wasn't, right? It's the same. Sorry, I didn't mean to unmute, but um, we actually have brothels on our street, but they're not really as such. They're like restaurants where the women will just sit outside to try to entice customers, and then they'll have you know separate places inside where they can get different services. And I, I remember being like so surprised that like especially near the airport, there's just like strips of these places, and they supposedly you have to have a pink light. That's like one way you can tell it's one of these these places. But um, talking about what drives it, I think it's not just demand it's also um like the women need money so like it's they view it as a service at least here in cambodia that it's something that they can do that they can make money um and so it is the demand side of like the sin you know making that driving that industry but also that people that poverty poverty is driving it too because people are poor and they don't have opportunities for education and they don't have um they don't understand self-worth. They don't understand like who they are in Christ and um, that they're made in the image of God. Like all of those things, if you come from a worldview that Bolivia is very different because it is Catholic. So theoretically they have some of that built into their worldview if they understand it. But here in Cambodia, it's Buddhist and they just, they don't understand. Um, so I think when we pray against that, we, we pray of course against sin and against sexual immorality, but we also need to pray for their eyes to be open to their worth and um, for, I think, the church to come alongside these people and help them have their basic needs met so they don't need to do things like this or don't think they need to do things like this to have a living. Yeah, and I had a question, and Bolivia was, 
what was it mostly like bolivians who go to the to, to the brothels or is there a big amount of foreigners like in cambodia a lot of both come but there is like a huge like um sex pat is what they call them these expats who come for for sex and prostitutes there's a lot of people who come as tourists for that in cambodia is that also true in in bolivia i don't think so and we're we're we are speaking to one city um you know we don't i don't have full knowledge of everything so el alto was the city where we served and what we kind of gained from, from the missionaries that, that were full time i think it was mostly bolivians absolutely um the food industry and I totally agree with what you're saying. I think when I said, you know, um, the human nature drives it from maybe the, the, the people who are coming to the brothels, but one of the hardest parts for me of the trip was um, these ladies, it is poverty. Um, they don't see another way out. They, it's, they don't see another way to, you know, feed their family and feed their kiddos, right? Um, you know, I had a lady with definitely had a question and complaining to me and um, giving me post concussive symptoms and, you know, kind of thing. You need rest and, you know, going through some of those things. It's just like, yeah, it's like children in the start. And then when you're faced with that kind of reality, you walk away with, you, know, you don't know what to do. And then, you know, I just kind of would say, God, given this up to you, I don't know what to do in this circumstance. But absolutely, I agree with you. I think the situation that, you know, kind of handed to them drove a lot of this, which is very simple. Hardest part for me personally. But. When uh, uh, I was in college, which uh, was uh, several decades ago, uh, back in the 60s, um, and some people look back nostalgically at those times as if everything was innocent, but it certainly wasn't. And uh, I was in a sociology course at uh, Brown University where the uh, instructor um, uh, had us read a batch of material about how. Uh, prostitution was a so-called crime without victims and that it should be uh, legalized, you know, um, because uh, uh, there were no victims. It was mutually consenting adults. But this is a very abusive um, and exploitative um, and manipulative uh, trade in sin. And so there's a, everyone is a victim in it. Um, they're very, very challenging. But see, now, now you get in, into a worldview question. And apart from a faith-based worldview, um, these kind of things are all up for grabs. So in a transition, I'm going to say, Ethan, you said something about how you're preparing to teach a worldview course. Uh, I, I, I would be interested in your notes, you know, if you come across anything, because we're dealing with very serious worldview things in the United States right now, yes. um, with this yeah. uh, a woke way of looking at things, which is basically an oppressor oppression, uh, mm -hmm. Marxist uh, worldview uh, behind it and very atheistic and has gotten into the LGBTQ plus uh, thing which is the sexual side of things in, in validate supposedly validating that um if you if you folks are willing to stay awake longer we can come back uh but i, I would i would like to offer our african missionaries now they're not really africans although they've been over there enough that they might be turning into africans uh, mm -hmm. on us and we have uh, Chase uh, Miller and Jerry Svoboda and Adelaide there. Wh which one of you wants to go first? Chase. Uh, Jerry. Chase. <laughs> no. go, go ahead, Chase. Because, yeah. <laughs> because there's some overlap, then, you know, then right. I'll know what to say. Okay. Okay, okay. we'll let Chase go first. Uh, All right, let me share my screen here. Okay. <clears throat> That's weird. It's taking me to funny places. I'm it's wondering. The bottom, that, that yeah, I hit that. Here's Jimmy. Hi, Jim. I don't know if you have any idea what I do here. Lisa's has been taken to funny places, Jimmy. She, she <laughs> wants to go to Africa. <laughs>
Are you finding your presentation there, Chase? Um, I'm trying here. I think you need to I do here. open. Oh, no, uh, this is not that. good. You need to open your uh, I think you might have to share it because something uh, there's some protective device on my computer that's not letting me. Can you share it, sweetie? Can you do it? And just I'll try. It. Let me see. While they're figuring that out, I wanted to uh, welcome particularly Caleb and Anija. Um, those are the two students I see, uh, medical students who are here with us today. I don't know. There's another student visiting with us, Jessela. Jessela. Okay. She's um, applying to medical school also. Okay, Jessela, nice to have you. There we go. Wait a uh, second. Yeah, one here. First. <laughs> oh, that's Jerry's, yeah. Let's see, have I got something here? Is, who, whose is this? This is Jerry's. Okay. That's Jerry's. Mm -hmm. Okay. We all need a helper, Bill. Yeah, we do. I've got. Uh, I've got. I'm no help at all with this kind of thing. <laughs> He's up a creek. We got and Bolivia. And this is this is yours, isn't it, Chase? No, no that's Jerry's. Just Jerry's. The blue one is Jerry's. See that? Now, I've got. I've got something. Kenya 2021. That's it. That's mine. That's yours. Can you see it? No. I'm, yeah. I'm seeing it. Uh, my screen sharing is paused. <laughs> it's really uh, uh, peculiar. We're both having we're both having challenges here. Um, let me see. There is this. Wow. Well, I don't know. I've got. Uh, let let let's do this. Let's have Jerry share while you chase. Okay. See if you can figure something out there. Okay, I'll work on it. Okay, Jerry, you want to give it a go? Okay, I'll I'll. Um... Did you share? Yeah. Okay. There may be technical difficulty. Okay, I'll I'll uh, I'll try it. Okay, go for it. Are you seeing things? Yeah, I'm seeing the, a black a thing that says you're sharing your screen and it's black there and it here's is. your presentation. You got it. Now you just need to put it on the slideshow. Okay, okay. Second from right, so yeah, just go there. up to the slideshow. Up, up uh, along the top. How's that? Are you now, seeing it? Did, can you can you go up to the top file thing where it says slideshow and just do slideshow? I see um, the arrow down there near the draw at the bottom. It says your screen sharing is paused. I don't know. Okay. I, mine says you are viewing Jerry Svoboda's screen. Okay, which is okay. Resume. Okay. There, there. Now go across the slideshow. Okay. Yeah, you got it. Okay. Yeah. Should okay. Well, you haven't Great. clicked on it yet, have you? Can, We're not seeing the slideshow. We're seeing okay. the arrow there on slideshow, but it, it says your screen sharing is paused, and I have a choice at the top that says resume share. Is that the yeah, thing? Yeah, go for resume share. I okay. guess. Okay. Okay. Wow. What do you see now? 
just, just the same thing from the beginning. It, it, uh, it's not moving anything, and your arrow isn't there. Oops, there. There we go. Are we switching slides? Yeah, yep. it is. Yep. Yep. Okay. Not are you whole screen? But it's okay. You gotta get this presentation. Okay. That. That one. Yep. Well, it's not doing anything. Okay. Okay. Uh, let, let me try it again here. Sure. Uh huh. Nail this down. There you share. Ah. It. You got it. Okay. 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 Not sure how we did that, but. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Go for it. Okay, I don't know if I can switch slides now. I'm frozen here. You are? Yeah, it doesn't want to switch my slides. I just have this slide. Really? It, it doesn't? Yep. Ah, you can't, you can't right click on it or something. Bill, can you advance their slides for them? No, because that's their screen share. Hey, hey Bill, here's another possibility. Yeah. is um, you can open my file and then click through that. That was working for you before when you were trying to get Chase up. Well, let's try that. Okay, Look, I'm gonna you can I'll, share. I'll stop the share here. Okay. I will start the share here. Okay, all right. Let me see if I can find now. This, this, um, I don't know. Yeah. Now we've got, there we go, Chase. That, that's Chase's. This which is go Chase. <laughs> go. We should chase Chase. Okay, let me see. Here's this one right here. And we will do this and we'll do this. Now can any can anybody see this? Yes. Okay, and that. Is it changing? No. It is on mine. My Sorry. screen share uh, is paused. Hello? So someone's got a suggestion. Jashula has a suggestion. I think the way that it's not sharing is because you guys didn't put, press the un unable edit on all the way on the top. If you click that, you'll get access to it and you can move it up and down. The enable uh, editing? Yeah. Yes. Okay. You see the enable editing up at the top, honey? No, I don't have an enable editing on the top of Protected mine. Protected view. The file originated from an internet location. It might be unsafe. Click for more details. Enable editing. I, I don't have that. I see it. Yeah, we all see it, but OK. Maybe that's the way I sent it, and I need to resend it. But let me try and share my screen again and see. Unshare your screen, Bill, if it's unshared. I did. No, oh, it's not going to do Thank it. Thank you, Jashula. Well, we've got ourselves a predicament. Oh, no. oh now Chase Miller is sharing. There's your Kenya slide. There it is. Okay. Can you see it big or is it little? It's it's little but acceptable. Well, go go to go to your slideshow option right up at the top on that orange stri strip slideshow click that and then go play from start and see what you get aha uh aha -huh. uh -huh. nice and big okay all right sorry for the delay here okay right. i was um in kenya two times this year so far i am going again next weekend mm. so and i'm i've been twice this year i went once to tenwick hospital which is in Western Kenya, which is the location that I go most of the time. And then I also went to Kajabi Hospital, which is about an hour outside of Nairobi. So if I'm, my first trip was in July um, and that I went with my son Isaiah and my husband Jimmy. And it was uh, a fruitful, very fruitful trip. Let me try and advance my slide here. Um, when I go, I bring I bring equipment every time I go because I'm trying to build up the location and my goal is to make it ready for a full-time EMT. 
So right now we have two to three EMTs that are coming in periodically to attend the hospital. And I'm just building because our goal is really to have someone full time. We have plenty of business there. So this trip I brought a microscope, an office microscope. So we have an operating microscope. I've brought the drill. I brought all the ear instruments. So I'm building that sort of leg of ENT right now. And as God always does, he utilizes everything, all of me and more of me than I have and every instrument I bring. So there was plenty to do in the office, removing foreign bodies, wax, putting in ear tubes and things like that. And, and then I, I, I also, of course, had the, the, the um, OR cases. And this was a one and a half year old boy who had had this bump on his ear for about three weeks. And mom was just traveling from location to location and facility to facility, trying to find someone to operate on her poor child who had a real high fever and was really quite ill. And he had acute mastoiditis, something that we do in the States, but this was a little kid and this is, you know, resource poor Kenya. So not something easy to take on, but the Lord was just so faithful to bring me everything that I needed. And, and the surgery went well and the kid did great and had no complications. So it was really a blessing. This is my son, Isaiah. So we started about five years spitting patients with hearing aids. And this is an arm of, of the mission work that I'm doing that the Lord is really blessing. It's just been amazing to have these patients with profound hearing loss that haven't heard in years and to put a hearing aid on and have them be able to communicate with their families. Um, having said that, it's a super involved process because the Kenyans really aren't used to anything all that technical and to get them to figure out how to turn the volume knob and how to change a battery and how to work these things is an involved process. Um, so Isaiah was a huge help. He, I taught him how to fit hearing aids, how to make ear molds and he would fit them and counsel them. And it was an hour to an hour and a half process with every patient. And we fit 25 to 30 patients, children and adults. That's a huge blessing. And as the Lord always says, he brings tons of tumors by usually my first day is full of tumors after tumors. This is one woman that I was able to operate on that had a parotid tumor, which was a low grade malignant tumor that had been operated on at an outlying hospital. You can see the incision there. And um, often this happens where the surgeries aren't complete or the surgeon backs out when they get over their head. And she said a month after the tumor was removed, it was back and growing larger. Yeah. So we were able to remove that and preserve her facial nerve function. That was a, a blessing for her. This guy has an amelioblastoma, which is actually pretty common. I've seen a lot of these. You know, he's just been sitting on this. You know, in the usual fashion, they'll wait until they can't function anymore or can't eat anymore um, until they come in. And he has an extensive um, growth. You can see the soap bubble appearance of the mandible. And he needs a resection from angle to angle. Uh, and normally in the States, this would be reconstructed with a free flap, but we've just been using hardware to reconstruct this and patients do pretty well. But um, he was presented with this and unfortunately he did not show up for his operative theater visit. So he's out there. I might see him again in a week or two when I go back. And I'm always amazed at how the Lord uses everything, every visit, um, every encounter is important to the Lord, even the little things. And I made a decision right when I started this work to talk about the Lord with every encounter and pray for every patient that was open. And, you know, that's super easy with the the big tumors and the patients that are dying, but what about just presenting the gospel to them when it's earwax? And so I do that with every patient and 
the Lord's so faithful. This, this man had just allergies. He just came in for allergies, but didn't know the Lord. And um, through our discussion, he gave his life to the Lord. And at Tenwick, there's a great partnership with the chaplains and we can notify them. They'll come up, they'll counsel the patients further. They'll hook them up with local churches. They'll provide a Bible in their local language. So it's a, it's a great teamwork. And I also, the, my first day had a, a young girl who came in uh, with voice issues and she, um, you know, got her treatment, but her father did not know the Lord. And in discussions and further talking, he gave his life to the Lord and was connected with the chaplain. And, you know, even the small little simple to care for surgical problems become huge there because patients wait so long to come in. This is a seven month old who had a ranula of the floor of his mouth, which is a, a blocked salivary gland, the sublingual salivary gland, which normally we'll see these when they're infants and we'll marsupialize them, open them up, drain them in and out quick. But this is obstructing the kid's airway. So intubation, everything else becomes a challenge. Um, but we were able to care for him and get him back eating and breathing appropriately. Um, this man uh, is a 22, 24 year old guy who tried to commit suicide. He took a blunt object and uh, tried to you know, slash his neck multiple times and was found on the side of the road by a good Samaritan, brought into Tenwick casualty and brought to the OR. And we were able to stabilize his airway. And he had a tracheal transection that was reanastomosed and he did well and was just so, he was amazingly grateful he, uh, that his life was saved by the Lord. And um, I don't know how the whole end of the result went because I wasn't there when he was discharged, but it was a blessing to care for him. So um, that was my Tenwick arm. In the fall, I went to Kajabi alone. Um, I was connecting with David Nolan, who is an otolaryngologist at the Kajabi Hospital. And this is a, a hospital about an hour outside of Nairobi and definitely more developed than Tenwick Hospital. They have a much better infrastructure, billing system set up. They're much more organized in um, scheduling their surgeries. So easy, easier to navigate and more English speaking patients, but definitely a different culture than Tenwick. So I went to help him sort of unload his surgical schedule. He had a queue of 180 patients that were waiting for surgery. Um, there's a, a story about uh, Kajabi. Um, there's a cemetery just outside of the hospital. And the story goes that the first missionaries, they did two things before they went to Kajabi. They would build a casket and bring that with them and they would have all their teeth removed um, to prevent from a fatal dental infection in the pre-antibiotic era. Um, and that, so this is from the cemetery. I was walking through the cemetery and found this gravestone for Colin Davis and his birth and death were February 10th to February 13th. And it says, naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I will depart. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. That's from Job. In three days, he changed the world. So I thought that was just amazing. I um, wanted to share that. That says a lot. This is the team that I worked with. We had a couple nurses that were great, as good as the nurses in the States. They knew all the equipment. They knew the surgeries. They were great first to assess. It was really helpful. And anesthesia was excellent in, in the real difficult airways that we can have in, in ENT. So it was a great team to work with. I did a lot of cleft lip and palate. Usually in the fall, I go to a nearby uh, cure hospital for cleft lip and palate. And that um, has not been occurring the last couple of years because of COVID. So there was definitely an overflow of lip and palate. So these were some of the kids that I did 
that had the cleft lip. And that's just a huge blessing. It's a physical um, transformation for the child and, and such a blessing for the whole family because of the stigma that goes with having a cleft deformity in Africa. And the cleft palates, um, David showed me a new technique uh, to elongate the, the palate in addition to closure. And this was a huge help for me and had lots of practice there. So I'll definitely be utilizing that. And was just blessed to rub up next to David Nolan while I was there. I did a bunch of ear surgeries, um, which was also a, really a blessing to do um, in a mission hospital as I get prepared to do that more of that at Tenwick. And they had a great microscope. This is just one of the kiddos that I worked with that had uh, nasal stenosis. So just in summary, this is probably my life verse. My grace is sufficient for my power is made perfect in your weakness. And I, I learned a ton on this trip and I went to unload David's huge operative schedule, but really I think I learned a lot more from him than, than I was able to bless him with. Um, it was just really refreshing to rub, rub up next to another ENT that had experience in working in a resource poor area. And he's very skilled and I learned a ton from him and was just blessed to, to work with him. But even deeper than that, I just felt the Lord was just reinforcing to me um, that I am who I am and I'm, and I'm who God created me to be. And I, I don't have to be perfect. And I don't have to know how to do every surgery or care for every problem that he's got it. He's so much greater than that. It's okay when I stumble because he's got me and he's going to go before me and he's going to make a way for me. And he's you know, he's not calling me to something that he's not gonna give me everything that I need for that, that I don't need to be fearful, that uh, it's okay to be over my head because it's never over his head and he'll give me everything that I need. Um, and I'm not gonna bring him glory if I'm working in my own natural abilities. I'm gonna bring him glory when I'm over my head and he's taking care of everything and he's going before me and making a way and I'm just grabbing hold of his grace. And, and that's when his power and goodness is revealed. Um, so I, I just wanna encourage others that, you know, go out on these trips and, you know, it is, there is some fear there and it is a little nerve wracking because there's a lot of things that we're not used to, um, but he's got it and he's, he's there in every moment. So thanks for listening. That's a wonderful chase. Um, I wanna emphasize something that you said um, that you share uh, Christ with everyone you see and you don't just uh, save it for the big bad stuff, which um, kind of raises the question about how big is a God-sized problem and um, if anyone wants to know how big a God-sized problem is, the first place to look is a mirror. And, uh, and, and then uh, you recognize uh, other people are in the same condition you are. And you reach across and there's a trust level there, which is a gift to our profession that, uh, that people will, will trust us. And then we trust God and just share with him instead of saying, well, now I'm going to triage these and see which ones are the worst ones. And then I'll try to see if I can fit sharing in with those and I'll let the other ones go by. Um, so uh, thanks for highlighting that, uh, Chase, and uh, being an example for us of, of uh, his victory in the midst of our weakness. Uh, I, I want to... Uh, uh, see if we can sneak the Svobodos back in. Have, have you guys got any ideas about getting your slideshow going this time? And then we'll do some more Q&A for the Africa teams. Um, I'll try to share screen again. And Jimmy and Chase, based on your very recent and expert experience, chime in. Sounds good. <laughs> okay, I'm seeing... 
you tell me what you guys are seeing. Nothing. And... Oh, now your screen is up. There's your slideshow. Okay. Will it progress? No, it will not progress. It's your um, your trackpad or your mouse. Don't try and hit a key. Okay. Um, it scrolling the mouse, the wheel on the mouse doesn't change it. The down arrow doesn't change it, and page down doesn't change it. Yeah, but when I used my keys on my computer, it wouldn't advance. But if I used my my keypad, my mouse. Okay. Thank you. Um, Here you are. I think I think you have put it together. Thank you, Lord. <clears throat> um, well, we almost overlapped with um, with Chase in Kajabi, and Adelaide and I, uh, based on a small experience for a month in um, Ethiopia a couple of years ago, I saw that the general surgery programs they're in Africa and there, there are 10 of them in an association called the PAX program. Let me see if I can uh, change. Okay, thanks, Chase. Um, just to back up a little bit, um, Africa doesn't have many doctors compared to the US. If you do the math here, they have about um, 1 12th of the physician density of the world on average. This is hard for me to believe, but this is what I was able to come up with. But you see the bottom line there, they, they have um, far fewer physicians. And um, when it comes to surgeons, the problem is even more dramatic. So I've highlighted how many surgeons there are in the US and how many in some uh, high-end European countries um, and then Kenya and some other African nations are on the right, and you see how things fall off rather dramatically. It is said, but I, I can't really document, but I think there are some smaller uh, African nations that may not have a single surgeon. Um, the PACS program is, stands for the Pan-African Academy of Christian Surgeons, and Chase knows about this, and you guys have heard about this before. They have expanded. Um, Bill was in on the early days of this, um, but there are now 10 general surgery programs uh, throughout Africa in, in nine different countries. And there's also a head and neck fellowship, uh, which is new, and three orthopedic residencies all of which are new since we were in Ethiopia in 2018. And there's also a pediatric surgery program, which Chase uh, elbowed up with there in um, Kajabi. Um, and they're beginning other ones, as you see there. That's a branchial cleft cyst, Chase. I, I, I wasn't doing the case, but... Um, so these are the countries that the PACS program now exists in. And the purpose is to train African doctors. They don't have to uh, be from the country where they're applying. They just have to be African and be willing to remain in Africa and to share the love of Jesus with their patients. And it's very competitive from what I'm told. Um, and this is the progress report. Um, so far, they have graduated 135 surgeons and that's a huge thing in a, in a continent where some countries have no surgeons. These people are practicing in 21 countries, and there are 123 more presently in training. Uh, that's a picture of a fellow named Chala, along with a, a patient and his mother um, in Ethiopia. And... If you go on one of these um, trips, you partner up with Samaritan's Purse or another sending organization to get out there and provide the logistics. And there are long and short-term opportunities. And I believe our Cambodian friends um, were with a, a two-year post-residency uh, Samaritan's Purse arrangement earlier in their experience. 
So here's my recruiting slides early rather than at the end. Um, should we all be listening more? We, we all know the story from 1 Samuel where, where uh, Samuel, who's the, who's the man of the Lord, he didn't realize the Lord was calling, much less um, uh, Eli didn't realize, much less Samuel who was just a boy. So should we be listening more or listening harder or listening differently? And this is a favorite quote of mine from Oswald Chambers, uh, part of which says, the call of God is like the call of the sea. Um, God's call is simply to be his friend to accomplish his own purposes. Our real test is in truly believe, believing that he knows what he's doing. Uh, Kenya, it was, this was our first uh, time to the country. Um, it's in East Africa. It's a large country with a large population, independent from Britain since 63. And the capital is, is a large, uh, crowded city. And, um, but most of the people live in a rural setting, much like what you see here. The main export of the country is tea, and uh, we know it for tourism, uh, animal life, and uh, marathon runners. Um, you have to ask yourself, which country has the Christian problem? Is it Kenya or is it the US? So these are uh, new statistics, uh, of people who are identifying as Christian. It's um, very easy to talk about God in Kenya. Eighty-five percent of Kenyans uh, are now identifying as Christians. You want to? Oh, this is just showing um, the locations. <clears throat> so you you basically fly into Nairobi and then get a driver to take you up to. Shows on the next one. Oh, it's on the next slide. Click your left. Oh, here's here is Kajabi up here, and Nairobi is this teardrop here and Kajabi's up there. So not a bad ride up to Kajabi. Um, the, the two places we went to um, were Kajabi and Latane. I put Tenwek on there because it is sort of a referral center as Chase alluded to. Tenwek and Latane are about an hour apart. We've never been to Tenwek, although we've been close to it driving by. And uh, the drive from Kajabi to Latane is about five hours. Four hours. Four hours. And uh, this tells you what sort of residencies are in each place. This is an overhead view of um, Kajabi. It's really three hospitals in one. Uh, they call Bethany Kids, which is really just the pediatric wing of the main hospital. So that's two. And then Next door is the Cure Hospital, which is um, largely orthopedic, but apparently from what Chase says, also doing clefts and other things. So uh, I don't really understand the Cure concept as well as Chase might, but it appears they go around uh, the country of Kenya and hold clinics in addition to having centers. Um, so just for a minute about Kajabi, it was begun as a hospital in 1915, and it's considered a referral center. Uh, they're expanding their operating rooms while we were there, and very nearby are um, a large school. It's sort of K through high school, I think, and it's where all the missionary kids from Africa go to school, or, or at least it's available to, and they want to go to school there. It's a good experience for them. There's also a Bible college on the campus. Whereas our experience in Latane was quite different. This is a, a much larger town than the town of Kajabi. Latane is a bustling metropolis, but um, the hospital is much simpler. One might say primitive, and it's a new residency too, the surgery residence. There were only three while we were there and they added the fourth uh, the Monday after we left. They started the residency two years ago and they had two uh, second year residents and one first. 
and another first joined after we left. As Chase mentioned, it's very resource poor. And in the lower picture, you see me with, with uh, all three residents and all three surgeons. So there are three surgeons there, all of whom are Tenwick graduates. This is the only PACS program, Chase, in which everybody is a PACS graduate. And uh, may I point out, Chase, uh, can you guys see my arrow moving? Yep. Yeah. Um, that's Dr. Philip Blasto. He's an incredible man of action and a wonderful personality. And this guy is some thyroid surgeon. I will tell you what. Um, it's a sim much simpler hospital than Kajabi. Um, and we had a great time there. Um, these are our living quarters in the two places. I don't know where you lived, Chase, when you were there. Uh, this was called Roller House. All the living quarters are, uh, because we're a married couple, or I don't know if Jimmy was with you in Kajabi or not, but um, no. this uh, roller refers to uh, a, a bird type. So all the housing is named after a different bird. In Latain, uh, we had one fourth of this building. There are two apartments on each floor and uh, the other three apartments that we didn't occupy were occupied by the surgical residents. Yeah, and wow. uh, we went to church in Latain, not in Kajabi too much, but Adelaide's got a little song to play. <clears throat> Anyway, it, um, it was a great experience. Uh, we went to this church both indoors and outdoors. I, I'm not sure if it was how the weather was going to be because it, it rains every day in Latane for the tea, you know. Yeah. And teaching vascular surgery, unlike some of the short-term trips we've done, there was no dramatic vascular case. Um, in the non-westernized part of Africa, vascular surgery, uh, has really very little place because uh, life expectancy isn't such that you get into too much atherosclerotic disease. So most of the vascular surgery that's, that's not being taught, um, but that they need to know as residents has to do with trauma. Um, and like the, cha the case that Chase showed with the attempted suicide, something like that. So what the about way- What about rotted body tumors, Jerry? Oh yeah, that's oh, right. Yeah. And, and and we saw, I saw, we had no big case while we, we were there at either place this time, Chase. So um, so God was doing something different and uh, ward rounds, didactic lectures, uh, the, all sorts of things show up in the general surgery outpatient clinic and, uh, you know, and in the OR. And, uh, but there was no big dr uh, dramatic vascular case while I was there. Um, Kajabi has this nice classroom with a projector. Latane being a little simpler setup, they had a library and only three residents. So you, you put the residents at a table and they did have a flat screen that, um, and an IT guy. So it all worked out. Um, these are just some clicks from some of the talks I gave. Um, so they were very eager to learn, and these are not simple people in any way. They're extremely intelligent residents, extremely bright. And, you know, part, the main thing is exposure of the principal arteries and how to stop bleeding and having a little vascular toolkit. Um, and they were very eager to learn. Um, Adelaide stopped in as my lab assistant. But uh, in Kajabi at the lower left, uh, they held a, it was almost a whole day lab um, where we sewed these uh, rubber blood vessels that I brought with me. And they were carrying around the product uh, to show off to the other ones. And they were, it, it became very competitive at how good a job that they could do. And then um, 
I don't know if you met Dr. Akini while, while you were there. Um, she's there, very pregnant in the background. And uh, Rich Davis, I'm sure you met. Maybe not. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Um, Dr. Akini <clears throat> brought in, um, she stopped at the butcher, and we spent part of this time doing a small intestinal anastomosis on, a, on goat intestine. And I would advise against this if you're trying to teach vascular anastomosis. It's nothing like an artery, and it takes three days to get the smell off of you. <laughs> but, but the practice was effective for them. It, it's basically to get people not to be afraid of taking a stitch in a blood vessel when there's bleeding and how to control it so that, so that you become the person that knows what to do in a panic moment. Um, Chase, this is, um, they had surgery clinic, general surgery clinic was held three times a week. And one of the four exam rooms was the thyroid room. There was such a steady stream of thyroid disease. It was incredible. And um, the one second year resident just ran this room herself. And she knew all the medical management for anything that could possibly present. And there was a lady with a goiter who she said, um, you know, uh, I'm just going to send you over for a chest x-ray to see if you sound like you have a history of CHF, ba -da -ba -da -ba -da. and half an hour later, she showed up with this x-ray. So this one went on to Tenwick. Wow. So presumably that's not her thyroid, Chase. Yeah. yeah. But, but the impressive part was really um, not the gotcha picture but the expert medical management of, of thyroid disease and how they were so organized with so very little. Um, they do have a national healthcare system in Kenya. Um, it's not an entitlement. Even the poorest have to pay $5 a month. And no matter, and if you're making $200,000 a year, uh, US equivalent, you still pay $15 a month to participate. Uh, in the general surgery clinic and all the clinics, uh, from what I could tell, there were no appointments. You just showed up and waited, put your name on the list. And so if they say, come back in two weeks, you come back in two weeks and sit, but it was actually extremely efficient. Um, this is the kind of, this was an, admittedly the most dramatic thyroid done while I was there, but um, he, he this uh, Phil Blasto, he's just a wonderful, with very poor instrumentation, he's doing a wonderful and very safe job. Um, there's a dramatic picture, so close your eyes now if you don't want to see it. Um, we were called suddenly to the emergency room to see um, this, which this picture on the left was taken while this was still attached to, to a Yes. Oh, a woman about 40 who had just been a passenger on a motorcycle and gotten into an accident. And these motorcycle accidents are daily occurrence in Latane because it's the taxi cab and, and there, there aren't that many cars. Um, so this lady had a, um, needed a, a toilet amputation through the knee joint and then was revised to a long above knee amputation. And she did very well. Um, surprisingly, at both places, unlike Ethiopia, prostheses are available. So it has to do with the cure uh, setup, I believe. But people do get prostheses in Kenya, um, and they don't in Ethiopia. Um, and then the, the, someone in a sandal walked in with this melanoma to the general surgery clinic. With the arrow over there. Yeah, didn't, didn't come to the uh, emergency room, you know. And similarly, didn't come to the emergency room, but waited in surgical clinic in those chairs out in front. And he sat down in the exam room and you can't see it here because by the time we took this in the OR, a couple hours later, the stick had receded further. Um, I'm sure Chase has run into something like this, but this, how, how this exactly happened, uh, good luck, but. Yeah, that's <laughs> crazy. Yeah, that is crazy. And uh, he, he did extremely well and um, God bless us all.
Oh, um, I wanted to be able to help in some way, although they didn't really want me being a nurse since I don't have that training. So <clears throat> at Kajabi, I just did sort of inventory and in helping out the housekeeping folks. Um, but in Latane, I was able to work in the pharmacy, which I really enjoyed and just loved being with these people in the pharmacy who were so welcoming to me and loved their work. It was just an incredible experience. So, and then I always, I always loved the kids, um, uh, sons and daughters of medical people who live in the apartments nearby. So they like to come over and we talk. Kids just collect around Adelaide. Oh, so anyway, well, we did actually have a stove and a microwave. So, you know, we were able to get along doing our own cooking. And then we happened to go to a, a nature preserve one day and an African high school was having their field trip. So they were just the really fine young men and the big draw was my binoculars. So, you know, we let everybody try the binoculars for a little bit, but uh, the people of Kenya are just so sweet and in, in general, I just, it's just a wonderful population. And you know, part of it is their Christian background, I think. Uh, part of it is just maybe genetic that they are just a happy people overall. And naturally we didn't see every poor rural person with, with a lot of problems, but oh, these are the two little girls who live next door in Kajabi. And Jerry saw an African chameleon. Um, anyway, we had a little party and then they gave a nice goodbye for us. This was in Latane and we're birders. So they're just always some good birds to see. <clears throat> so I don't think uh, Kenyans, I mean, it, it, you know, you can encounter anyone who needs to encounter God. And um, I don't think we have to understand exactly what God is doing with us. If you feel called, go for it. Praise God. That's it. Mm. That's wonderful. I like that. Questions. Do people have uh, questions for uh, Jerry and uh, Adelaide? Thank you, Jerry. I thought that was great to hear. Oh, thanks, Chase. Version. Um, we we just came home beaming. We loved our trip. We just loved dealing with these people. Yeah, the Kenyans are just really, they're just so welcoming and so loving. It's amazing. And I, I, I think it is, it is unusual to find someone that doesn't know the Lord, but I am amazed at how many I do find. And then there's often um, patients that have slipped away in their faith um, and when you dig deeper with them you realize they really aren't walking with the lord so you know just encouraging in that in that area is a blessing folks have questions for uh for chase uh, uh and jimmy also um i'm seeing the cavanaugh's there Looking very wide awake, we had a little daughter, Kavanaugh, who popped her head up in Daddy's lap, and uh, and they're they're reminding me that we were all together several years ago for that that child's birth, and so it's good to see you guys again. I remember the experience very with great fondness. Um, it, one of the things that Jerry talked about uh, was um, hearing God's call. And uh, I've been thinking about that kind of thing recently, so I'll say a couple words. One is, where does he call from? A and where are we? And he's calling from heaven, and we're here on earth. And so there's a spiritual boundary that has a door in it. And Jesus said, I'm the door. And I come and I knock, and I'd like to come in and talk with you. But what he comes to talk about is an invitation to come through the door and go to the other side and to be adopted and to be a child of God and to live in the kingdom of God. 
And so we end up living in two kingdoms, the kingdom of God and the kingdoms of this earth. And we travel back and forth between them. And we're in one, but we're of the other one. And it's wonderful to see you folks living in the kingdom of God while visiting different parts and being ambassadors of Christ uh, there. And um, we can all do that, I think, right where we are. We don't need to get on an airplane, you know, and travel. He, we've already been invited and are in the kingdom and wherever we go. So we don't have to put on our missionary hat and then be spiritual and then come back and be a, uh, unspiritual Americans again. We can be our, the same people wherever we go and, um, and practice our faith. I've been, I've retired, uh, graduated into retirement from medical practice three years ago. And I can tell you that if you don't practice something, it starts to slip away. And if we're not practicing our faith, it slips away. So I just uh, offer an encouragement when you hear God calling, uh, go through the door, stay on the other side and do the kind of things that our brothers and sisters have uh, shared about. Uh, somebody mentioned uh, Ethiopia. Uh, you know, one of our medical students uh, has been called to Ethiopia and she went over um, this fall and then there was the political crisis and it was unsafe and she got um, called back here. Now she's going back over. She's been released to return. Um, she's going uh, this weekend. And so folks can hold up Clara Pack. Uh, I think she was thinking of traveling with you, Chase, wasn't she, to go in February with you if she couldn't go to Ethiopia? Yeah, yeah, I was hoping to grab hold of her, help me with these hearing aids. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm sorry, the, the, the Lord called her and has snatched away your helper there. Um, yes. Ethiopia. So, um, uh, <laughs> We just have to uh, see how that works. And you, you are leaving. Uh, you and Jimmy and is uh, your son going also in February? Yeah, the other son is going. Um, the one that wants to be a neurosurgeon. Yeah, so we leave Sunday. Not oh, this wonderful. Sunday. Not not tomorrow, but the following. Yeah. Now, and you'll be gone for how long? A month. A month. I, I'm going to post your your letter on the. Um, ERMCCF website uh, for those that are interested. And speaking of which, I'll just put in a plug for our directory. Um, if you want to contact any of these people who've spoken, you can find their contact information in the uh, directory that's um, hidden behind a password, uh, which those of you who have eyes to see will see uh, cleverly written on the page, in fact, that you need to use um, on the grmccf.org website. And I'm encouraging you to go and look and open up the directory and check your own listing and look through and see if there's any updates that you think would be helpful so that we can keep that current. I'd also like to mention um, last year we had uh, among the people who shared with us at this missions Zoom was um, Daniel and Priscilla Cummings. Yes. And uh, they are in Angola where they have been for a couple of years. And um, Priscilla was diagnosed with um, uh, malignant breast cancer um, this past fall, I think it was, and is having treatment for that. And they would appreciate prayer for her. They have uh, three children. So if you could keep Priscilla Cummings in prayer in Angola, along with her family, that would be much appreciated. Now, I'd like you to look on your screen and see if you can see our colleague David Ness uh, there. He had his bride with him for a while. She's probably in the vicinity. Uh, you guys are in Mexico. David, can you tell us a little bit about what's happening down there? Uh, yes, can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay, we have an unstable uh, uh, internet connection, so feel free to cut me off if it, if it goes south. Um, I would just say that our, um, 
our work here is to contrast it with previous presenters is more based in, a, in an oasis with no red light district. We have a, we were on the campus of a Bible college, but our, so we do work out of the clinic here serving the town and the churches that send people to us. But we also relish going out to the mountains and coastal towns, whereas medical brigades, we see many people in great need and offer them the care of Christ through medicine, but always prayer. And we typically have among non-believers something like a 50% um, acceptance rate of Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And then their names are left with the local pastors to disciple. Um, right now in Oaxaca, um, some may have read this state is uh, let go 5,000 medical workers at the end of last year, of which 2,500 were physicians, and some hospitals have closed, and, and there's less availability of care. Omicron is upon us, but fortunately it's fairly mild um, with regard compared to other, the Delta variant and others. Uh, but we are unable to purchase tests anymore in the state of Oaxaca to, to have in the clinic. So we make clinical diagnoses and treatment. You make do with what you got, which is, I think, describes a lot of missionary work. Um, and actually, my wife may return. She just went upstairs to check the laundry where Saturday is a laundry day for us. So... <laughs> I love it. How long will you be down there, David? We'll be down here two months, um, coming back the first week of March, unless our COVID test is positive. So that'll get bumped back a week or two if that happens. All right. So you're going back and forth uh, from here to there. Uh, what, what's your uh, what's your schedule? We we like to come down for two or three months in the winter. Okay. We've been doing that since the beginning of 2000. And, 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 but are you both retired from the honey oil practice? We, we retired in 2007. And in addition to continuing work down here, we then stepped into migrant health in Western New York, visiting dairy farms in the region. But we, we gave that up a couple, three years ago. So now our, medical work is just down here in oh. Mexico. Wonderful. Are there other uh, reports or questions or prayer requests or um, informational inquiries uh, in, in the midst of our group? See. Uh, Bill, I'll be bringing a team down to um, San Pedro Sula um, in Honduras in June, and um, our focus will be working with the women who are involved in prostitution down there. Um, it'll be the second time that um, that I've visited uh, that ministry. Um, a, a friend who's on the on the line or on the you know on the meeting with us now, Pat Ensman, who's a retired teacher in Rochester. She's been trained on um, you know doing um, visual acuity testing and that sort of thing. She'll be coming down with me to do um, fitting of eyeglasses. Um, if anybody's interested in, uh, in joining us, um, I'm really looking for GYNs. I've been uh, messaging Leslie Purnell, um, but uh, our longtime faithful GYN um, who's come down several times to Nicaragua and was in Honduras with us in 19. Um, she's dealing with long COVID now. So we have family docs who can certainly rotate into the GYN aspect of things, but I otherwise only have a, um, a nurse practitioner who's a GYN uh, nurse practitioner and a SANE nurse examiner. Um, but uh, if any of you know of any GYNs who might want to join us, um, our trip is June 4th through June 12th. Well, what other kind of um, help would be helpful? Uh, 
Um, I only have one, I have one logistics person right now um, who will be helping with, you know, queue management and everything along with the local people, you know, at the ministry. I don't, I don't have a lab tech person. And on these trips, we do, you know, we do rapid HIV tests, we do um, rapid syphilis tests, um, urinalysis, um, urine pregnancy tests. Uh, so I don't have anybody that is designated to do that at this time. I, um, and I don't, have, I don't have a commitment from any nurses. One, the director of the program down there is a nurse, um, so that's, that's where, you know, I'm, I'm sort of set with primary care, with med keys, with family docs, and with an internist who's way overqualified, who's boarded in nephrology and intensive care medicine. Um, but she's been down, you know, with us several times in Nicaragua and uh, is looking forward to this. So really the need that I have is GYN nursing and somebody who would be, you know, willing to do like some rapid rapid tests and that sort of thing. That could be a medical student even. Um, so yeah, those are my needs. Wonderful. It's really a joy to see all of you uh, again this morning in the midst of uh, our uh, distance in COVID. And uh, we uh, are looking forward to perhaps do a little break in Omicron uh, after that passes and being able to do more again. We haven't had any in-person meetings for quite a while, but do please keep in touch with us. Uh, and I'm wondering if uh, anyone among you would want to uh, or feel called to to uh, close our meeting in prayer. Um, I'd be glad to close us in prayer. Mm -hmm. Father, we are so grateful to you for the work that these folks have done, even in the midst of this challenging time, uh, for their willingness to take risks, to step out in faith. And um, Lord, I pray that through this time that we've had, you would make God connections with people whose hearts are being called and are prepared to go and participate. We do hold up the needs that if each one has mentioned, we pray for, uh, we pray for um, Priscilla Cummings and for healing for her. We pray for this trip to um, Honduras, that you would provide for this team and protect them as they go. We pray for uh, um, Chase and her group that's going back to Kenya, and I pray for your Holy Spirit to guide and protect and strengthen her as she reaches out. Um, we are grateful, Lord, for your love for all people and how you do provide for us and how you are our strength in our own weakness. We turn to you and receive from you uh, all that you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. It's a, a, a joy to be with you, and I'm seeing that uh, Leslie is putting in a text message here, and um, uh, we pray for you and your situation too, uh, Leslie, whatever that is. Uh, we, we invite you all to uh, stay in touch with us and to one another. Uh, ch check out the directory, uh, reach out. Um, to uh, us and to uh, other colleagues, um, we, uh, we all are blessed by the fellowship of fellow believers who can understand and, and share our heart during this time. I'll just uh, close my comments by saying I think we're in rather unusual times in the United States. Uh, the ideological uh, challenges that are really facing us and my reading of things is that we may be on the cusp of a uh, of a, a revival of faith in this country and mm -hmm. of discipleship and so uh, be bold in sharing the gospel uh, wherever you can uh, because i think hearts are going to be open uh, people uh, faces cover pretty well sometimes but underneath there's a lot of uh, openness mm -hmm. So uh, 
God bless you as you uh, as you reach out to those around you with uh, God's love. It's a joy. If you have any questions for us, be sure to contact us. Uh, I'm seeing someone in there. Uh, how many medical students do we have? I see Caleb is on. And um, Anisha. Anisha. Uh, are there others of the group Jish there? Jishula. Jishula. She helped us, yeah. Okay. Um, how is the how is the student group going this year? Caleb? I think it's going pretty well. Um, we are, I think next week, finally gonna be able to meet in person yeah. with the university regulations being lifted up on, uh, on this virtual month that we've all had. So we're all very excited to finally be in person again. Um, and, uh, and things are going well. Wonderful, wonderful. Anything to share with us, Anisia? Oh, we just finished all of Hebrews and we're gonna do this thing where we're gonna try to read through all of it and get the overview picture. So it's been a really big blessing and yeah, we're excited. We are, we're uh, looking ahead to uh, seeing if we can gather with you folks this spring. There's uh, the Ryan's up there and Ryan has uh, got a heart for uh, the students and any of the others of you who have a uh, a heart for students, please be in touch with us because we're want to, wanting to come alongside uh, as things start to open back up again. A rich bliss. Bill, if I can just make a plug, um, you know, for the, the local Women Physicians in Christ group too, um, our next meeting is uh, this coming Friday. Uh, most, most of the people um, that I send the email out to don't attend, um, but you're always welcome. We've got a, a pretty nice core group of folks who are, are pretty faithful to attending month after month. We've been, uh, you know, switching over to a Zoom platform, um, you know, since the weather got cold. We did have the uh, privilege of being able to uh, to meet in person for a few months out on the back porch of Heather Ma. And, um, and you know, and we have had medical students join us, you know, sometimes. It's it's a women's group, sorry guys, but you know, but it's but it's been it's been a um, it's really been enjoyable to to get to know uh, fellow uh, providers, um, you know, and to really just be able to share our hearts and have time of fellowship. So, so now now uh, Chris, what's your definition of a Christian woman physician? Would Christine Bernie count for one of those? Christine has been on the email list and has been invited. <laughs> Absolutely. No, I feel very included, but thank you for thinking of me. And uh, yes, Christine, I, I look at all of the um, invitations when they come and we have a Bible study group that we attend on Friday night, but I'm always hopeful we can attend. So keep me on your list. But I will thank, keep you on the list. You. Oh, you're, you're fine, Christine. And, and, and actually, right. actually, Cheryl, Cheryl Parnell, um, Joy, who's a PA, an ENT PA, she um she joins us regularly um oh, and, janelle, and janelle is on my you know on the email list as well wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. i love it it's it's a joy to be with you all uh and i'm going to unless we have further messages or things to share i'm going to uh, uh close our meeting out and look forward to catching up with uh, any and all of you in the weeks ahead God bless you all. We love you. Thank you so much for organizing. Thank you so much. Yeah, good to see Kavanaugh. <laughs> <laughs>